All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next panel is titled, How AI is Transforming Business. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. And I'll hand it over to Jeff, our moderator. Excellent, thank you, Patrika. Um, hi, my name is Jeff Richardson. Um, I'm gonna be introducing our panelists today. Um, and first, I'd like to start with Jose Murillo of uh, Grupo Benorte. He's the Chief Analytics Officer. And uh, Jose, feel free to uh, introduce yourself. Hi, Jeff. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Jose Murillo, the Chief Analytics Officer for Banorte. Banorte is the second largest financial group in Mexico, um, a bank which has uh, leapfrogged international competitors such as Citibank and Santander in, the, in recent years through its um, uh, efforts to become a data-driven organization. Excellent, thank you very much. Next up, we have Alex Ratner, who is the CEO and co-founder of Snorkel AI. Alex? Hey, Jeff, thanks so much. Um, I'm Alex, yeah, uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Snorkel AI. We're a uh, two-year-old startup company that spun out of the Stanford AI Lab in 2019, uh, building a, a data-centric programmatic ML development platform based around a new way of uh, labeling and managing training data. And uh, this was based on a, a Snorkel project uh, that started back in 2015 at Stanford. Um, that's been deployed in places like uh, Google, Intel, Microsoft, uh, um, number of government agencies, healthcare scenarios, et cetera. And I'm also on faculty at University of Washington in the computer science department. Super excited to be here and chat today. Excellent, thank you. And uh, next up, Robert Robinson, the Chief Product Officer and Vice, Vice President of Advanced Sensing at Honeywell. Robert, hello. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Robert Robinson. Um, I am the Vice President and Chief Product Officer at Honeywell Advanced Sensing Technologies here at Honeywell. Honeywell is a large conglomerate. Uh, we have a number of businesses here. Uh, one of the key drivers in our business is technology, and uh, that innovation starts from the sensing element, and we leverage and utilize a number of um, AI capabilities and initiatives within our business. I'm really pleased to be here. Excellent. Thank you very much. And last, and given the auspicious uh, panelists we have today, probably least, is myself, Jeff Richardson. Um, I work for a company called PPD, where I am the Vice President of Technology and Data Analytics, and I am the CIO of the uh, Accelerated Enrollment Division of that organization. PPD is a Global Contract Research Organization, or CRO. We work with many pharmaceutical and drug companies, providing um, integrated drug development, laboratory work, life cycle management, and the division that I work for uh, helps to enroll patients and run patients through clinical trials for phase two and phase three trials, things like most recently, many of the COVID vaccine trials. Um, we were partners on uh, quite a few of those over the last year and a half and, and currently ongoing as well. So welcome everyone, thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll jump into our first question. All right, so to everyone, when did you first learn about AI and what was your first experience with it? Um, and we'll start with Jose. Jose, take it away. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess like many kids, uh, I was a sci-fi uh, fan. Uh, and uh, my first, uh, the first time I learned about uh, AI was uh, when I watched uh, Star Wars and uh, later on Blade Runner and uh, Space Odyssey. And it was a time that you can imagine a fantastic future, although in some cases it could be dystopian. So that was my, the first time that I knew about AI. And the first time that I really used AI was when I was working for Banorte and I was trying to improve the, our customers' experience with the, our efforts to, uh, to sell them uh, credit cards. So it was not as cool as, as in the movies that I watched, but it was really very effective. We increased our conversion rate by um, 80%. Excellent, very interesting. Um, Alex, how about you? I mean, you must have a, a pretty significant history with AI. Uh, well, I'm gonna start in that same theme of that great answer and say that my first, I think, uh, you know, motivational exposure was, uh, well, yeah, I think uh, you, you hit some of the list uh, <laughs> that I, uh, I loved as a kid. Um, I, I also mentioned maybe the foundation series by Isaac Asimov, since there's actually a a TV show coming out and of the, uh, you know, science fiction renditions of AI and how it's done today. Uh, probably the most accurate, you know, uh, I think that the, the, the basic plot there is they 
predict the future in the sci-fi universe by looking at um, statistical principle or you know, statistics of population movements and stuff. So, uh, you know, giant counting machines is actually still uh, the most accurate uh, depiction of how AI and machine learning specifically works today. Anyway, the great series TV show coming out. And then first actual exposure, you know, I'll start more with a problem than a solution. I was working um, with uh, some, uh, some, some of the patent corpus, which I, I first of all found fascinating that you could, if you at least don't include the images, you know, you could have all of the, uh, the, the, the intellectual content that people, you know, in the United States ever thought was worth, uh, uh, you know, patenting in a thumb drive. And it was that accessible, but it wasn't readable. It wasn't parsable or usable in any structured format. And if you go deeper, you know, doing the simplest thing, like, you know, getting all the patents that belong to IBM under the various names and aliases was actually a terrifically difficult problem. So this led me into the world of natural language processing of dealing with these uh, extreme complexities of information and language, um, which we still deal with at Snorkel today, where our platform supports customers doing things like, you know, pulling stuff out of complex legal contracts or news feeds or, or social media or, uh, you know, PDF forms. Uh, that led to uh, how NLP was starting to be done back then, as about a decade ago, uh, which was uh, machine learning and AI. So that's my uh, my answer. Excellent, thank you, Alex. And Robert, how about you? Yeah, I have a pretty unique experience in my mind. I think um, I have a, an engineering background myself, but sometime uh, after high school and a few years in college, so something popped up where every time I went to a website or anywhere and I search for something um, in a few hours I would start receiving messages or emails about something so if I had googled something I would start getting this email so that was my first experience in trying to understand why um, how did the system how did the infrastructure know that I was interested in maybe a plane ticket and why do I start getting emails about hotels and you know car rentals because I searched for a plane ticket on my laptop or something. So that was my first experience with AI in trying to understand you know what this is and what it's used for and kind of the application. Um, I wasn't a big uh, Star Trek fan per se, but uh, just from that, it really sparked my interest from an uh, early stage in, in high school and, and college. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad that you went some other way because it would have been weird if all four of us just said it was from sci-fi movies. Um, for myself, yeah, too many sci-fi nerds on a, a, a call, know, right? the whole thing will devolve. I feel like I'm weirdly dating myself like as a child in this, but like my two introductions to AI were the Terminator and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Those are the first ones I can recall. I don't think I understood when I was younger that Star Wars droids were actually like artificial intelligence, I guess. Um, but my first real application of this was at, I majored in computer science in college, and there was a heavy focus when I was in college on security and cryptography and things like that. So there wasn't a lot of AI courses at the time. But when I graduated and got my first job, it was at a company that made uh, hydraulics and hydrology CAD software. Mm -hmm. And they actually pioneered a uh, genetic algorithm that used artificial intelligence to optimize um, hydraulic networks in potable water in cities. And I had to do tech support and help work on the product with our customers. So that was my first experience with how that worked. Um, and then the people that were doing that development were actually going, just graduated from a bunch of, of masters and degree programs in AI. And I jumped into one of those programs and that's how I got to where I am now, which is all weird neural networks and poorly fit regression models. <laughs> um, awesome. So what Jeff, an interesting, actually... oh, go ahead, sorry, Alex. Oh, sorry. I was just, I was just to say it's actually uh, you know one could have a whole discussion about the the different you know sci-fi correspondences to, to AI today. Like I, I I think it's you know just to make this this uh, I'm not going to totally trail off and ramble, but just you know one quick thing is that if you think about actually the difference between like you know Star Wars, like you said about those droids, you know not realizing it's AI, um, actually encapsulates a lot about how the field uh, got AI wrong at, at first. You know, starting back in the '80s where we thought, you know, the Star Wars droids, they can talk and speak and move around environments and, you know, see things, but they can't pilot a, a spaceship and they can't, you know, do a computation to go, you know, to the next planet. And that's where we thought as well, you know, back in the 80s, there was like a summer program to just you know, solve computer vision, because that's something that we find easy. So it must be the same for, uh, for, for AI. And, and then it's, it's very interesting that it actually turned out to be more like the uh, exact opposite, right? We're still uh, struggling to do the most basic thing with, you know, 
reading contracts at scale or reading content on the internet, but uh, you know, right. complex computations or flight controls, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, stably solved problems. So it's, it's, it actually, anyway, I'm sure we could do a whole nother panel discussion about the, uh, the different, you know, no, sci-fi that so, got so it right or wrong. Like, I, just, I couldn't help myself because it came up. Yeah, we, we, we perfected like AI chess. And I love, there's a meme that I keep seeing with AI where it's the um, like AI vision gone wrong and it's pictures of Chihuahua faces and blueberry muffins. Yep. And like, it's, it's how bad AI gets that over and over again. And we just can't seem to perfect that one. It's, it's really interesting. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, a theme maybe we'll come back to uh, in, in terms of you know, practical applications later, but I think there's a, a ton of, I mean, a ton of hype in the market today and in the space, uh, but a ton of real value. But I think the value is from being able to kind of not really do anything well enough to do very simple things well enough, right? You know, we can't right. have an you know, a, a AI approach, you know, read and parse a contract like a lawyer, but, you know, we're getting to the point where, you know, uh, uh, whether snorkel or other technology, you can maybe use it to read a simple type of, of clause or fact at scale, right? So that is a tremendous value provider, right? But it's still just a baby step uh, compared to what people often think it is, which is this, you know, grand singularity. But um, maybe we'll return to that uh, later in the-, in the All right, jump, right. jumping into some meaty questions. Let's move on to our next question here. Uh, what sorts of projects, industries, and business functions stand to benefit from AI the most and why? And I guess relevant to each of us, like in the industries you are in, where do you see that going? Um, let's start with uh, Alex. I'll, 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 I think I ate up some of my time talking about Star Wars robots, so I'll give a quick answer here. But uh, you know, <laughs> one very exciting answer uh, area, uh, and, and this is biased based on where we focus, but is around unstructured data. So one of the things that the the last you know five or so years of progress and things like deep neural networks, Jeff, to your comment, have really given us a step change ability around us. Things like you know, uh, text data, PDFs, images, videos, all this stuff that isn't, you know, nicely aligned as a bunch of columns in a spreadsheet. And so, um, yeah, I think that's going to, you know, that has been and will continue to be one of the next frontiers in, in terms of where there's um, still very tough, but there's a lot of uncaptured value uh, and, and efficiencies to be leveraged. So that's that's one one area that I think it's it's great to look to these days. All right, Robert, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, just from my experience and my background and where I come from, I think there's just a tremendous opportunity around the cognitive science area and with respect to sensors and application of sensors. Um, if, you, if you really think about it, most of what sensors do today is really just measuring different, you know, different measurements or different things that we want to measure. I think the next frontier for sensors and components like sensors in the whole IoT space is really trying to use that data and predict or uh, do some analytical, uh, provide some analytical insight with respect to what that data means. Because most of what we do today is collect the data and then uh, there's an analytical phase to it that is almost separated from the system itself. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for artificial intelligence within that space to not only empower the systems at the urge or at the sensor level to measure or collect data, but also at the same time present some predictions or some analytical capability for that system or that edge. So I think that's a really an untapped area for, for, for AI where sensors could really be empowered with, with that capability going forward. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, just not, not to, to plug your company too much, but we just moved into a new house and we have I think eight different Honeywell th smart thermostats in yeah. the house. Yes. And I mean, we are, we're right there. Like they are, they're collecting, they're doing things based on programs, but if they could just have that like slightly next level where it was like, this is obviously the next thing you're going to want with whatever it's doing, that would be huge. Yes. Yes. And it, it's, it's amazing because, you know, there, there's been some, some work with some partners and things around the smart home when you think about your home and the things that you do um, everything from your filtration system your hvac system uh, your refrigeration and the consumption of energy within your home there's a lot of sensors to the devices that monitor that and measure things and give you information but they don't act on it you right. know it's not a closed loop you still there's still a lot of human interference having to come in and do something um, having to you know interject in various places and I think the AI offers some capability in terms of enabling those devices to do a number of those things themselves and eliminate the human intervention that we have in the majority of applications where you use sensors today. I, I welcome our robot overlords. 
Um, all right, Jose, how about you? What uh, what projects, industries, business functions, where do you see this growing, like, especially in your industry, where I think you've done a huge transformation recently? In, you know, a large determinant of the well-being of people is their financial strength. And, and I think uh, I work in this industry, and per perhaps I have a bias because I have a larger knowledge here, but... Uh, at the end of the day, I think that our natural intelligence has fallen short to deliver uh, to our uh, customers uh, in, into a situation where they are financially strong and they have a better understanding of, 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 of their finances. And, uh, and at the end of the day that they don't fall prey to their own uh, cognitive biases or, or their own uh, shortcomings. And I think that artificial intelligence has uh, a great potential to, uh, to make people's lives better if, uh, if their finances improve significantly. We've uh, done several projects to, to, uh, to help people uh, increase their savings rates and, and become, uh, uh, and that's, you know, uh, like uh, at the end of the day, you would think, well, you'd like, uh, as a bank, you would like people to be really indebted. And no, that's not the case. You want to have uh, the view is to, to increase their customer lifetime value. So you, you, you want to do, to do business through a long period of time and, and that they are able to survive for a long people, for a long time with, uh, with you and that they use your products in a, in a wise uh, fashion. So I think there's a great potential in finance and that's why you've seen so many fintechs uh, that they are arising uh, and, and challenging the, the traditional way of uh, doing uh, finance. Yeah, I am really excited about that. It is really, it's, it's interesting to watch an industry change so much as the financial industry with, with machine learning and just more powerful information management. So in the, in the pharmaceutical space, AI and machine learning obviously is, is hugely, hugely impactful um, specific to what, my division does the accelerated moment division. It's it's an kind of a thing people don't think about, but it's incredibly hard to get um, patients and volunteers into clinical trials, both in a timely way and effectively and when they're needed. So we use advanced AI and machine learning to try to get the right people into the right trials for the trial to complete successfully, specifically with like vaccine trials that aren't like COVID vaccines. You have a very small window of a flu vaccine or an RSV vaccine time frame to get people who might actually get the, the virus um, within the window of the study going on. So tactically getting those, those people targeted and notified and finding the right people is, is incredibly difficult. And yeah. I see that becoming only more and more prominent um, in that industry and helping to improve that faster, quicker, more agilely in the future. Um, any, other, any other thoughts or comments on that before we move on to the next question? Alex, any any tie in back to uh, to Star Wars? I'm not even gonna try. We have, we have, we haven't done our use case research there yet. Uh, we're we're still in this universe, but uh, check back Excellent. in a year. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So moving on to our next question. Um, which AI use case are you personally focused on and most excited about? And uh, I think this time we'll start with Robert. Yeah, so um, recently we launched our EdTech uh, device, which is basically uh, leveraging an optical sensor to be able to uh, identify pollens and classify pollen. So most people have pollen allergies, I do. A uh, number of us do have those. And today, primarily what happens if, if you go into, um, if you go to your home and you want to do a pollen test or you go into a doctor, um, they take samples and they send it out to a lab to get, you know, to classify what type of pollen it is and, and tell you if, you if you have allergies to pollen. What we did here in, in our group is basically take an optical sensor and basically try to classify uh, pollens based on size, dimensions, and shapes to detect and determine which type of pollen it is to tell you one, the pollen count and the type of pollen that it is. Now, this is a very unique thing because if you think about it, there's always been optical sensors or image sensors. There's always been pollen. So how can we do that? It's AI, it's artificial intelligence. It's using that device to basically over and over again, capture different images of pollen from different regions of the world and different regions and be able to classify all of those with some machine learning capability to deliver this. So as we go forward, this product that we've launched is a product that's going to help people basically determine one if they do have pollen in their environment, 
and two, what type of quality it is. So it kind of sheds some light into what we talked about earlier, Jeff, about the capabilities that you can embed in a sensor using artificial intelligence as you look forward to multiple things that we could do. So this is just basically the starting point for us. We've done it in one or two devices and we're looking to do it you know, significant devices, not just at the sensor level, but at system level, you know, uh, complex systems and, and, and higher uh, levels, maybe aircrafts, um, uh, refineries and other systems. That's going to be hard to follow up because I think I'm most excited for that too. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, moving on, uh, Jose, what, what, uh, what do you think? Well, the things that, that uh, are exciting me the most right now are those things that help us understand much better the way our customers think. And, and uh, we're working in the intersection between three things. Uh, all the disciplines that uh, help us understand the behavior of the customers, such as anthropology, social psychology, behavioral economics, experimentation to, uh, to really try the different things and, and, and artificial intelligence. We're, uh, Working, uh, we've been using causal machine learning to uh, to really expand very fast what we are learning about uh, our customers in our um, in our experiments, and uh, and we're building a behavioral map mapping of our different customers so that we can have more relevant conversations with with them and uh, help them uh, build a better financial future. Excellent, excellent. I'm going to sneak in, Alex, before you this time. Um, one of the things I'm most excited for with AI, like outside of the space that, that my industry works in, is just the ability for ML to just automate more tasks. I, I, didn't, I came from a software background originally and moved into this organization about a year ago, um, and I didn't really think about it, but companies that are not tech-based as their core, um, there's a lot of manual process in in just day-to-day -day business that could be accelerated and helped and free people up for more value add, like thought leadership things, um, just by using ML to do, you know, the tasks that you can learn from data and then accelerate that task from. And then outside of that, like obviously in what we do, the ability to focus more AI and ML on getting more patients into more therapeutical trials faster is like, that's the ultimate goal, right? It's helping to help patients, whatever's wrong, like help them get better. And the, the uses of AI specifically there are nearly limitless. Um, so I couldn't be more excited about that. Um, and Alex, over to you for our wrap up on this question. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, with uh, how exciting all those answers are. And that's the fun thing about AI and you know, machine learning specifically today is there's such, such breadth of impact and, and, uh, uh, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad umbrella. I'll give one quick answer uh, for uh, Snorkel, the company, and, uh, and then one uh, quickly on the academic side. I think uh, for the company, we offer very, you know, you know, it's a broad, very horizontal development platform. So I'll mostly just say as a theme, I'm, you know, day-to-day -day most excited about the use cases where it's really, a, you know, a zero to one type uh, shift. And specifically, we focus on what's called the training data. So this is the you know, if you want to classify legal contracts at a bank or assist with underwriting decisions of an insurer, you need a bunch of data that's labeled with the kind of the, the correct answer, the ground truth label, and the machine learning model learns from that. That's the basic idea of at least the, the workhorse type of machine learning supervised learning. And if you uh, can, you know, get that data labeled cheaply out of house, then sure, you can, you know, still cost a lot. But the things that most excite me, the use cases that excite me most are the ones that we're learning to unlock with new approaches to uh, programmatically and automatically doing this labeling, right? So rather than having to go to a line of business team and say, hey, can you spend a quarter labeling contracts so I can pull information out of them automatically? You uh, have them, you know, sit down and push some buttons for a day um, on, on Snorkel, and then they can get that data to unlock all the great AI tooling that's that's out there. Um, so that's, a, that's just a kind of broad theme. On the academic side, I'm always very excited about the uh, uh, medical uh, applications, in particular, uh, doc, uh, you know, physician assist. I think that's... Um, a lot of the you know Q triaging information extraction from electronic health records. We had some stuff actually around COVID also, or some collaborators did at, at the Stanford Hospital. Um, things that help uh, that kind of work with physicians to accelerate them. Uh, that's that's where I think the biggest uh, kind of you know uh, healthcare impact. Uh, or the, the, that'll be one big area of healthcare impact. So that's that's kind of academic side. 
that that ties in really nicely to our next question and my immediate thought on that next question actually. Um, so are there limits to how effective AI can be for business and what are those limits? Um, and I'm selfishly gonna jump first into this because it ties directly into your answer now. But one of the limits that I see, right? Cause we deal with lots of patients, personal information, the health and safety of participants in trials and the health and safety of somebody afterwards after the trial is, is successful or not successful. Um, and one of the limits I see is it comes down to a, a bit of our trust in how AI works and then a bit of the inherent pitfalls in how AI works, those black box models of, of an AI algorithm where you know you feed in very good quality data to something and you kind of let it run unsupervised for a little bit and then you know you don't pay attention and it does something horrible as an outcome. And even one horrible outcome in, a, in, a, in an ocean of, of 10,000 outcomes is, I mean, it's, that's horrible and it will doom whatever you're doing to it's, it was dangerous, you shouldn't have done that, right? So uh, the, the limit of how AI can be leveraged for medical data safely and successfully and transparently for me is one of the, the biggest areas I think that we need to focus on just as technologists of AI overall um, to build those transparent, auditable AI algorithms that we can really prove are safe and functional and you know move, move everything forward successfully and safely. Um, so curious what everyone else thinks there. Um, I guess let's jump first into uh, into uh, Jose. Sure, Jeff. Uh, I think uh, in a philosophical way, you can think that there are more limits to AI are similar to the, the limits that you would like for natural intelligence. If, yep. if you had a human that it's super intelligent, you would you would want that he's he would be working for the good of humanity and not. Uh, not uh, just to uh, for its mere destruction, but in a more pragmatic way, uh, what I would like to, to tell you the, the limit is the data, and uh, and uh, and uh, what you can get really depends on, on on the data, and and that's where you need to be very creative on how you use or on on uh, very much untapped resources, because in many companies. You don't even have to go and look uh, elsewhere. You have lots of data that probably you have discarded and have not really understood correctly. But, um, but I think that's, that's the, the true limit that we face. I, I couldn't agree more with you. The, the amount of information everyone collects is amazing. And if you can just put it to proper use, and I mean, touching like not intentionally on what, what Alex does though, it's classifying that and building those like proper training sets like really is, one of the biggest burdens I, I, I feel in making that successful. Robert, what, what do you think about that? I couldn't agree more with Jose. I mean, it, it's, there's not a scarcity of data. There's tremendous data. Um, I think the key, the limit is the ability to curate, model that sample data in an effective way so that you feed the, the machine, you know, the right type of data. I think most times to your point, Jeff, when you said, you know, you could have a mistake, one error. Uh, most times when you, you know, when you root cause a solution that error, it's really fundamentally based on the fact that some data set or some data links are missing, right? You, you feed the model with certain things and you miss certain types of data or so certain configuration of data. So I think having a very robust set of data samples and curating that, you know, properly and accurately into the system, I think that's the key. I think. The, 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 the intelligence of the system today in terms of computational intelligence and capabilities is almost un, uh, unlimited. I mean, computers and systems can do a ton today. I mean, in Honeywell, we're developing uh, some quantum computing technology capabilities and there's a lot you can do. The challenge is on the data side, a lot of people, and Alex, I think you could probably uh, shed some light on this. A lot of companies and a lot of people still struggle in terms of what data is valid, what kind of data to use. For example, sometimes you find situations where companies or entities will use sample lab data to build their machine learning capabilities and then deploy a system in, in real life applications where the sample data is completely different from what the real sample in field looks like, right? So you run into problems like that. So it's really understanding the integrity of the data, curating the right data, and expansive data in a larger set as possible 
to make sure that you enable the machine capabilities and artificial intelligence capabilities to be optimized. So I couldn't agree anymore. Yeah, uh, to your point there, also what I've noticed a lot is that the data drifts a lot as we as just things evolve. And yes. there is a limited ability right now to manage properly data drift in commercialized or productionized models. That's true. That is a continuous process. You find out a lot of times people launch a product and stop, right? Uh, like yeah. anything else, right? They take a look at the virus. It's mutating. There's a Delta variant today, right? Who knows what the next variant is going to be? Very similar trend in almost every data set. It's always, you know, pollens. Pollens change. the structure, the size. Um, the different mutations of pollen that happen over time. So there has to be a very effective long-term curating process of managing that data set and building mm -hmm. that capability. It's an ongoing process. It, it's kind of a journey. It's not a destination. You just keep going on that journey to, to really optimize the solution. And I, I'm noticing that's the hardest thing to sell up and downstream to outside people who are outside this industry, which is you've productionized this thing. We're done. Let's move on to something else now. But it's no, you, you now own this pet and you have to deal with this pet for the lifetime of this pet. Like you have to care and feed for this over however long you want to leave it out there in the wild. That's true. That's yeah. right. Yep. Um, Alex, what, what do you have to add here? Other, oh, than, I, I, other, I, than, use my, other than use my product. <laughs> well, I'll stay away from that one. I feel like that's, uh, you know, I, I try to stay away from uh, straight up sales, you know, sales talk on a, on, a, on a panel, especially the one as interesting as this one. Right. I also feel bad because I'm supposed, I mean, I'm supposed to interject some 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 controversy here, but I, I can't for this answer. <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree, um, you know, and, and Jose, Robert, uh, Jeff, you know, how you articulated it. I mean, I'll say it in maybe a slightly more provocative way, but maybe not for anyone on this panel. I think, uh, you know, AI is about data today, not models, not algorithms, not inference. It's, it, it all comes down to the data, yes. right? Obviously everything matters, but that's where, you know, orgs uh, you know, succeed or fail. That's where, if you look at state-of-the-art leaderboards, you know, uh, things, you know, win or lose about creative new ways of labeling or curating or sampling or uh, collecting sources of data, right? And uh, it's a pretty incredible place to be, right? We've, we've gotten all this fancy new, often open source, com increasingly commoditized mm -hmm. models, you know, algorithms are really algorithms singular these days and a lot of ML and, and, and platforms that are out there, all the tools, lots of the education coming out too. But the trade-off is they're all super data hungry and the data is at the center of everything. So, yeah, um, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think obviously, you know, one of the things that we've worked on for over half a decade are kind of, well, I'll say it, we also are strong believers, even down to the theory, that uh, you can't just, you know, make some auto magic solution to this data problem either, right? Has to be human the loop in some way. Yeah. What we've been working on, both academic side and company, for over half a decade is: can we make it more programmatic? Can we make it look? Can we make that human the loop look more like software development? Right. And you know, whether it's you know our approach or something like that, I think that is the way forward. Where you know we don't view AI as a magic box, Jeff, to your point where it's just deployed and done, you know, and then it's never updated. Uh, it is a journey as a living thing, but it's a journey hopefully that begins to look much more like the journey of any other mature software system where you expect to have, you know, maintenance and changes to spec. And, you know, it doesn't require a you know three quarter long relabeling or recurating or recollection effort. It's something, you know, you, you, know, you, you you monitor, you make it part of your practice, you 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 do ops, you know, there's a lot of talk in the space about ML ops. And then, you know, uh, with an approach like Snorkel or some other approach, you 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 go back and you update your data and you update your models. And um, right. I think where we're stuck right now is that we all kind of know that it has to be that living process, but it's so painful <laughs> to, to and labor intensive to do that that we don't know how to approach it. And so yeah. obviously that's the problem yeah. we're trying to solve, but it's really the field's effort uh, that that is really exciting to see. Uh, from, from it's, all sorts of uh, it's been interesting watching a business shift so much over the last like just 10 years like when I, when I was taking courses on this like we'd be given data sets with a hundred thousand records and it was get to you know the right answer academically but it was also like figure out a way to even just process that with even something as simple as like a basic neural network or like a decision tree or something and now I mean there's limit there's limitless calculation capability everywhere. You can throw this at distributed cloud computing and you can process a billion records in something that 10 years ago would have been impossible. Yeah. So it's it's been fascinating watching the underlying um, capacity become commoditized. And to your point, like even the algorithms are commoditized now. So like, it's, it's really interesting, which I think again, brings us nicely into our, our next and last question. 
Um, so how do you expect AI to change the business world over the next seven years? And I'm gonna add a caveat to this. How do you expect AI to change over the next seven years? Um, so let's start with Alex. What do you think? Oh man, the, t- the, the toughest question. I, I got the wrong rotation here. So yep. um, <laughs> I think uh, for, for, for business, I know we're, we're short on time. I mean, I, I'm a big believer that we're not gonna suddenly leap to the singularity and replace people. I think AI is gonna be uh, like supercharged software. Right. So we're going to see it, uh, you know, speeding up and automating how a lot of, you know, traditional processes are done. They're either done by hand, done by labor intensive coding or not done at all. Like, you know, reading through all your contracts or all your scientific articles or your R&D notebooks, et cetera. Um, So I think it's going to be very much, you know, assist and accelerate uh, rather than, you know, full scale automate. Uh, other than in some, you know, some isolated areas where that, that full automation will happen. Um, uh, and then I think in terms of technology, I think, well, I think there's actually a lot of interesting research going on right now in the field, uh, recent ML conferences around, how do you think of ML and AI if you're thinking of it as part of a collaboration between human and AI? That's not something I directly work in, but I think that that research is fascinating. And then also just, you know, putting data more at the center of things. That, that is the area that I work in. And you know, various ways, there's a flurry of research as well as commercial activity there. So those are some, some ways I think AI will, will change. Then of course, you know, explainability, trust, auditability, all these things are, are major areas of research. We're still just as a field figuring them out, but they're obviously so important. So I feel very bullish that, that we'll see very uh, big advances in those areas as well over the next, you know, couple of years. Excellent, thank you. Um, Robert, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I agree with Alex. Um, there's going to be a significant, uh, you know, successes and growth around augmentation of human processes. I don't think in the next seven years we're going to see a complete replacement of human activities uh, with AI and machine learning capabilities. I think there's going to be a, there's the, the continuation of the augmentation. So if you think about basic processes within companies, things like pricing, things like quotation, if you think about basic, um, you know, to, to other point, you know, documentation, legal documents, contracts, entities, and things like that, that you're going to continue to see that augmentation of human activities, driving more efficiencies and driving faster response speed and things like that. But I also think one fundamental thing that's going to change in AI itself is a lot of companies have tried and failed around the data aspect. I think the, 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 the realization that data is at the core of AI is becoming well accepted, well known. And I think you see a trend of data scientist uh, careers and people hiring data scientists. It's really at the core of making sure that the data that is needed and required to support AI and machine learning going forward is robust, it is clean, it is concise and clear. And I think in the next seven years, that's the biggest growth that you're gonna see is around that space. It's around data integrity, data curation for AI and machine learning capabilities. Excellent, thank you. Jose, we have a few minutes left. What are your thoughts here? Let me tell you from another angle. What I think is that we are at an inflection point. And what it will happen is that there are going to be significant changes within the firm, the corporations, and that's something that Robert was pointing out too. But what you will see is that the decision-making processes at the at the core of the corporations, it's going to shift from the salesman to more data science type people, data science trained people. So it's, you're going to be moving from the gut feeling to the data driven decisions. So, and and I think that what it will happen is that there's an inflection point within the companies and there's going to be a big change at which are the companies that are successful. And it's going to be in some sense like a bimodal distribution. There are, going, there are going to be some corporations, some firms that are really able to understand the change and, and to serve much better their customers with the significantly smaller margins in their operations, but serving larger, larger constituencies. And those are, it's going to be kind of like a winner takes all in some sense. And they're going to be some some of the laggards that are might uh, just not uh, not be around uh, in seven years. 
Yeah, I think that's spot on. I mean, everyone's been spot on there. I, I, I love the idea of automating small tasks and building those up to larger and larger and more intelligent systems. Um, so yeah, that sounds fantastic. Oh, excuse me, I've got dogs barking in the background. Um, so with that, I wanna thank everybody for your time. Robert, Alex, Jose, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Love the last 40 minutes. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Patrika. So uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you Everyone all so and much. Jeff and yes, this has been amazing. And thank you so much to all of our panelists and a special thank you to you, Jeff, for moderating and keeping us on track. That was My pleasure. amazing. I know this virtual audience is going wild with virtual applause. <laughs> we really appreciate the insight shared today. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.